Hi, welcome back. This video is on current and conductors. So we previously investigated voltage and its relation to electric fields. And we did this in free space. Now, in materials, we're going to examine closely current. Now recall from physics that current is basically charges in motion. It's the time derivative of charge. So we're going to take the viewpoint that current, which is a scalar by the way, right, just like 4 amps, or it doesn't really have a direction like north or something like that. Current is a scalar and we're going to take the viewpoint that it is a flux quantity, so there will be flux lines associated with it and so forth. Well, uh, if current is a flux, then there must be a density that is current per area just like there's electric flux, right, and then there's electric flux density. But what does a current per area mean? So let's think of a circuit that's just a simple resistive circuit where we have a voltage source like this connected to a wire. There has to be a resistor to limit the current. And of course there's a current I through there. All right, so that's a battery, let's say connected to a wire and then the resistor. The battery is a chemical source and it provides particles with negative and positive charge. In our, in our class we're not going to worry about what constitutes a battery or what, what's happening inside the battery. That's, a, that's actually a chemical engineering question. But you should know that electrons move throughout the circuit in a direction opposite of charge. That's by convention. So in my picture here, current is moving clockwise, electrons are actually moving counterclockwise. Now, wh why can electrons move in the first place? Well, what you have to understand is that conductors have valence electrons. Valence electrons are easily dislodged from the parent atom. So, so valence electrons are electrons that are not part of the crystalline structure of the conductor of the material and they're not part and they're not um, closely um, attra uh, attracted to the, the nucleus, the positively charged nucleus. You should have learned about valence electrons in chemistry or material science. All right, but that's what makes a conductor a conductor. You'll hear things like free electrons And free electrons basically mean valence electrons. They're, they're easily dislodged from the material, and they're free to go, go around the material. And so conductors, a good conductor, has lots of free electrons. There are also the, the, opposite, the opposite charge um, called free holes. And it's, we, we don't say free protons because protons are bound to the nucleus Op, um, uh, in places in the material where electrons are void we call those holes and they have positive charge mathematically they have positive charge and the mass of an electron so materials can also have free holes or you know free uh, positive charge as well anyway we know that the it's really the electrons that physically that are moving around in the conductor so this is, this is what you have to be aware of when you hear the word conductor, is that there are lots of free electrons in a conductor. And a conductor, in, in the figure that I've drawn here, conductor is the wire. It's also the resistor. The wire could be copper, the resistor might be carbon. Both of those are conductors. So we might ask ourselves, well, why is it, why is it that, that electrons will move in this path, why don't they just go off into the air? And it's actually a very simple question that maybe you haven't even pondered before, like in your circuit analysis class. Why, why, do, why do the electrons stay in that path? And the reason for that is that the, the conductivity of carbon, copper, is much greater than that of air. So the electrons follow the path of the wire. That's pretty cool. So this type of current is called conduction current. And we will later 
learn about displacement current. The current here in this circuit can be found with Ohm's law, but uh, in electromagnetics, we're mostly concerned about what happens locally, like at a point, than globally in the circuit. That's that's for circuit analysis. We're we're interested in like this point, any point along the circuit. What's the electric field there, and so forth. So, suppose the wire and and I should say conductor because this applies to the resistor as well, has a cross-sectional area A. So we've got something like this, and here's cross-sectional area. I guess I'm going to use I'm going to use S, cross-sectional area S, and suppose the current is moving this way. All right, and here's the conductor. And let's suppose that the current is more or less perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. On average, you've got you've got electrons colliding with one another as they go through this wire, the conductor, but on average they more or less move perpendicular to the cross-section. Then the magnitude of the current density. Remember we're we want to get to current density. We're going to use the letter capital J for current density is I divided by the surface area. Remember what got us here. We're going to consider I to be a flux quantity. So we want to talk about current density. So that would be current per area. So this is the flux or the current density. Now, the resistance of a wire, you should have learned this in physics, so wires are not perfect, certainly, and really the resistance of a conductor is the length of the conductor, so delta L, divided by A, or excuse me, S, the surface area. So the longer the conductor is, the more resistance it has, obviously because that allows for more collisions in the electrons and they, it's harder for them to get through. But the larger the surface area is S, the less resistance it has because the less collisions, the, the more space there, there is for the electrons to move. And it's, it's proportional. The resistance is proportional to this, uh, this ratio. And we put the constant of proportionality down here. We're going to use sigma as the constant of proportionality. And we call that constant the conductivity. The conductivity, and it has units of ohms to the minus one, meters to the minus one. So the more conductive something is, as sigma goes up, the less resistive it is. R goes down and vice versa. That makes sense, and that's why we put that sigma in the denominator of that fraction. Now, we said, again, that the magnitude of the current density is I over A. That's how it's defined. And then we know from Ohm's law, I is V over R. Uh, excuse me, not A. I'm using S for the area. I is delta V over R over S. And so I can get a little crafty here and write this as delta V over delta L, right, the resistance, bringing, bringing into play the resistance here, then times delta L over R times S. So why is that? So notice, notice the delta L's will cancel, and then I'll have delta V over RS, which is what I have here. So I'm just multiplying and dividing by delta L there. And then once I do that, I realize something that this thing here is sigma, the conductivity. If I take this equation and I rearrange it so I solve for sigma, you'll see that I get delta L over RS. 
So this is sigma. And what is this thing? When you have a change in voltage divided by a change in length, V over, v over L, that's the magnitude of the electric field in the wire. So then we can write this is sigma times E. Now, alternatively, we could express the current density. So uh, again, we've got this, this relationship here. We could alternatively express the current density as this rho v, which is not uh, the normal charge density, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, times u. So here, rho v is the electron charge density in the conductor. And it's the electrons because they are actually what's moving. The, the protons and the whole, whole is not actually a physical thing, but it's the electrons that are moving. So we use the electron density, then times this u, which is the average speed of the electron, or and this is related to the um, electron mobility, which you should have learned in chemistry or material science. So this is the average speed. So if you take, if you take the, the electron charge density, so it, that's coulombs per cubic meter times meters per second, the average speed of the electron, you get coulombs per square meter, coulombs per second, which is an amp per square meter, amps per square meter, which is the current density, amps per square meter. Okay, so this is an alternative way of describing the current density. Again, u is the average speed of the electron in the material. So we can, we can relate that to the electric field. How fast does an electron go in an electric field? That's related to mu e mu e is called the electron mobility it's determined by the material times the electric field so the speed of an electron is proportional to the electric field you've seen this in physics and again we can write this as j the current density is proportional to the electric field where this is sigma now I've been saying that J has this magnitude, but we know that it's a flux density, and a flux density should also have a direction. And so we define the direction of J to be in the same direction as current, which is also the same as the direction of E. So now the full picture would be that J, the current density, is equal to sigma times the electric field, with the arrows there. And this is what's known as the point form of Ohm's law. So this is another way of representing Ohm's law. Now, as we said, the current is a flux of current density. So, just as we've seen before with flux, it's the normal component of J relative to the surface area that contributes to the flux through the surface area S. And so we can integrate over the surface J dot DS to get the current through there, right? Just as we did for electric flux, we took the electric flux density dot ds gave us the electric flux. So now we take the, the current density, dot ds gives us the current flux, or just the current, right? Now, in order to calculate resistance now, so I'm going to come over here to the left. If a conductor, which, which by conductor we mean the wire or the resistor, has a uniform cross-section, with conductivity sigma, again, we can calculate its resistance like we we can come full circle here. We can take, we can note that I over S is J, which is sigma times E. 
and that is equal to sigma times delta V over delta L. Right? So how does the voltage change across this uniform conductor and, how, and what's the length of the uniform conductor? And if I rearrange that, I get delta V over I, which is by definition the resistance, right, from circuit analysis, is delta L over sigma times S, right? We've come around full circle. So that's how we can get the resistance if, it's, if the conductor is uniform. And by uniform, I mean the, throughout the entire conductor, it has the same conductivity, sigma, and it has the same cross-section S, cross-sectional area S. But if the conductor is not uniform, can you guess what we have to do in that case if it's not uniform? Here's, here's the resistance. The resistance is delta V over I. What happens if it's not uniform, the conductor? Let me, let me delete this. If the conductor is not uniform, then what we have to do is, is approach it in the same way that we've been approaching a lot of problems in electromagnetics. And that, that is to say, we take infinitesimally thin slices of the conductor and integrate. So remember that the voltage was related to the electric field, like this. So we consider an infinitesimally thin slice, dl, of the length of the conductor, take E dot DL over the entire length, and that gives us delta V divided by the surface integral of the current density, which is sigma times the electric field, dot DS. And you'll notice that in the numerator I've dropped the negative sign. The negative sign can be dropped here because whenever the numerator is negative, the denominator will be negative and we'll get a positive number here. That's because the current in a resistor always flows from positive to negative, so we don't, the resistance will always be positive. Okay, now let's talk about the power that a resistor absorbs. The power density is defined as P equals, not to be confused with the dipole moment, is J dot E. So take the, take the current density, dot it with the electric field. And so this has units, you can work this out on your own, as watts per cubic meter. Actually, let us work it out. Let us work it out. So the current density has units of amps per square meter, and electric field has units of volts per meter. So notice here, when you take amps times volts, you get watts, and then meter squared times meter gives you meter cubed. So that's why it's called the power density. It represents the power on a per volume basis. So how much power is our conductor absorbing per volume? That's what we're talking about here with the power density. And so if that's the power density on a per volume basis, do you, can you guess how we're going to get the total power that is absorbed by a volume V? Let's say the conductor has a volume V. Well, that's going to be the integral of the power density over the volume. So if this is lowercase p, then uppercase p would be the power, the total power. So we integrate over the volume of the conductor Take J dot E dV, like that. So we take a slice of the volume, dV, and we compute J dot E and that slice, and then we integrate over the volume. So this, this power is an important power, and it's usually referred to as, in this context, joule heating. You can witness joule heating when you cook a meal on an electric stove, or if you are using a space heater, an electric space heater, you can also get
get warm from jewel heating, right? When you have coils and those coils conduct electricity and then th that those coils get hot as a result, that's the jewel heating. All right, and finally, I want to talk about perfect conductors. Okay, a perfect conductor is a conductor whose conductivity is infinite. Now these don't actually exist, but like a lot of times in engineering, we make approximations and sometimes it's, it's convenient and pretty darn accurate to say that we have infinite conductivity. So let's say here's our conductor. Our perfect conductor and so it's got some charge distributed you know pretty randomly inside it. Now what you have to understand about a perfect conductor is that if we apply an external electric field let's say the elect external electric field goes this way so I'm gonna call that E sub little e for external what's going to happen to the charges inside the electric inside the perfect conductor is the the positives will go in the direction of the external electric field so they will kind of gather along this surface and the negatives will go against the electric field so they'll gather along this surface and they kind of create each each positive negative pair kind of creates kind of an electric dipole but an electric field that points this way against the external electric field. So here's an internal electric field now pointing against the applied electric field or the external electric field. And they'll do this because it's a perfect conductor. They'll do this and EI will cancel with EE, right? Electric fields superimpose or, or they obey superposition and so they add together and they cancel with one another and what ends up happening is that the electric field inside the conductor is zero. So let me write that down because that's important. A perfect conductor cannot contain an electric field. Within it. Remember, perfect conductor. Conductors have free holes, free electrons, and so they arrange themselves so that they're happy, so to speak, so that everything is balanced. That's that's the idea behind a perfect conductor, that there's no electric field inside that, that thing. So that has some consequences. Yes, the electric field inside a conductor is zero. Also, the volume charge density in there is zero. And why is that? Because of because of our equation, or Maxwell's equation, this guy, I'm going to leave off the epsilon zero. Remember this one? The divergence of D is equal to rho V, and D and E are related by epsilon. So that means if, if E is zero, then the divergence of E is zero, and that means the charge density inside the conductor is zero. Also, remember that voltage is related to the electric field. So this means that the voltage, uh, the potential difference, um, at any two points, A, B, inside the electric field, or inside the uh, perfect conductor, is also equal to zero. Potential difference, electric field, charge, density. All right, so... Now you've kind of gotten a flavor of the current density and how conductors work and, and the point form of Ohm's law. So we're going to continue talking about electrostatic fields 
in materials. Thank you.